Good morning. A million apologies for the delay. Uh, we have São Paulo with us, Fundação Getúlio Vargas in São Paulo with us. Uh, we are still trying to figure out how to put the image that we see in the control room right here. They, they are uh, seeing us right now. Uh, and uh, so we'll start uh, now we'll have a little introduction uh, and explain to you how are we going to proceed. First of all, welcome to the Rosen Center. Well, the Institute uh, for this event that is done in partnership with Fundação Getúlio Vargas Law School, Direito GV, <coughs> and the American University Washington College of Law. Uh, special welcome to uh, colleagues and friends from Fundação Getúlio Vargas that are in Sao Paulo. Uh, have joined us by sound right now uh, and very shortly I hope also you see the image. Uh, we are here today to talk about the meaning and implication of the mensalão. Uh, obviously there are more negative opinions than that in Brazil and there has been actually uh, exchange of opinions through the media, including uh, with members of, sitting members of the Supreme Court. Uh, the way uh, we are going to proceed here is first I would like to introduce uh, our speakers. Uh, Oscar Villena is the Dean of the Getúlio Vargas Law School. Uh, previously he founded and served as co-director of Connectus Human Rights, who taught institutional law and human rights at the School of Law Getulio Vargas and the Catholic University of Sao Paulo. He served as a state attorney and as executive secretary of the United Nations Latin American Institute in Brazil. Uh, you have uh, the full uh, bios. I will, you can read those for benefit of time here, I will read just a few lines of each bio. Uh, then we have the honor to have with us Peter Massetti, Senior United States District Judge from the District of, for the District of Maryland. Uh, a dear friend, uh, Judge Massetti received his bachelor's degree cum laude from Amherst College in 1963. Uh, he holds a law degree from the University of Chicago. I think his connection and love for Brazil started when he and his wife Susan served as Peace Corps volunteers in Brazil in the 60s. And he has been since been a connector, connection, connector between Brazil and uh, the United States, the judiciary of both countries. Actually, we like to refer to Judge Peter Massetti as Juiz de Fora, because he is, he is our Juiz de Fora. Uh, then I would like to, 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 to introduce uh, Judge Marcelo Costanario Cavalli. He is a federal, a federal judge in Brazil, like Judge Peter Massetti. He is a young judge. We having received his law degree in 2002 from the Federal University of Paraná, where he focused uh, his studies focused on accounting and finance. He specialized in economic criminal law at the University of Coimbra, Portugal, where he obtained a Master's of Science in Legal and Economic Studies. We have, last but not least, uh, the pleasure to welcome Professor Matthew Taylor, another dear friend uh, of mine and of the Wilson Center. Uh, he is Matthew's research and teaching 
which include corruption and organized crime, judicial politics, and Latin American political economy. He has lived and worked extensively in Brazil, most recently as an assistant professor at the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, Taylor is the author of Judging Policy, Courts and Policy Reform in Democratic Brazil. Uh, which was awarded the Brazilian Political Science Association's Victor Nunes Leal Prize for best. And more to the point of today's discussion, he is the co-editor with Timothy Power of Corruption and Democracy in Brazil. Uh, a struggle for accountability was published two years ago by the University of Notre Dame Press. With that, I would like to uh, invite speakers to start their brief presentations. We are going to start with 10 minutes presentations by uh, each of the speakers and then open up for questions and comments. Uh, Dean Oscar Villena will start us off, followed by Judge Peter Massetti, who will be followed by uh, Judge Marcelo and then uh, Matthew Ta Professor Matthew Taylor. With that, I'd like to invite uh, Oscar Villena to make his presentation. Thank you. Okay, Paulo, good morning. Uh, my colleagues on the, on the bench there, it's a pleasure to, to be with you. Uh, since you're not having the image, perhaps we could be more uh, uh, speedy in terms of speaking, not 10 minutes, but perhaps uh, five so it will be less boring for you to, to hear us. So, uh, what is the, the Men's Salon? Uh, the Men's Salon is a corruption scandal that involved several important members of the government, of the Brazilian government, uh, uh, in the beginning of this uh, uh, decade, or the last decade, uh, that were bribing uh, members of, uh, charged of bribing members of parliament to vote in favor of the government. Uh, because several members of the parliament were involved, this case has original jurisdiction at the Brazilian Supreme Court. So this is a uh, constitutional uh, 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 disposition that when members of parliament are involved, cases should be trialed, criminal cases should be trialed at the level of the Supreme Court as a regional uh, jurisdiction. And then you have uh, 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 a court with no appeals to a different court. So this was one of the problems since the beginning uh, of the case. The interesting aspect here is that the Brazilian Supreme Court, uh, the Brazilian Constitution uh, has a specific clause that says that when members of parliament are involved in criminal cases, these cases should be tried originally by the Supreme Court. So that is the reason why uh, this uh, enormous case involving uh, around 40 people were, uh, was tried at the level of the Brazilian Supreme Court. So this is the first point that I would like to, to make. Uh, the second interesting aspect that is uh, extremely different than what would be happening in the United States is that the Brazilian Supreme Court decides in public. Uh, it's not an in-camera decision, but in public decision. We have 11, 11 members at the Supreme Court, and they work uh, not just in public, but these uh, sessions are televised uh, to the whole country. So, uh, and this is not happening only in this case. This is happening since 1993 uh, when uh, there was a first decision of the Supreme Court to allow uh, television inside of the court. And today we have a television, a public television doing this. So you uh, can imagine what was uh, uh, the, the consequences of this. Uh, the country started to follow this, uh, 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 this uh, trial that had uh, 60 sessions in its uh, first uh, uh, part. Uh, you, the court would meet three times a week. So for a long period of time, every day, you would have at the Supreme Court the debates around uh, the case. Uh, 
the third aspect that I would like to mention is that this is not a normal case to be trial at the Supreme Court, even though it was there in its uh, jurisdiction, uh, 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 there was a, a, a problem uh, because the Constitution asked or did, uh, uh, obliged that the, the, the both ca uh, cameras of the Congress would allow for a, a, a trial at the Supreme Court, but this was amended. So since then, uh, the, the cases could arrive directly at the Supreme Court. So this is the first uh, uh, time in these 25 years of the new Constitution that in fact we have a large criminal case of corruption involving uh, higher hanging uh, uh, authorities before the Supreme Court in this uh, long uh, trial. Uh, the, result, the result after these 60 sessions uh, was that uh, 25 uh, uh, people were found guilty, uh, but 12 of them by a very divided court. Okay, so there was not a majority that uh, would uh, 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 obtain a certain uh, level, uh, uh, so there was uh, a doubt if there were more than four descendant votes, if there was a possibility of a new appeal, a motion for reconsideration, a motion for he hearing uh, this case. So in the last uh, uh, week, we had a decision of the Supreme Court that yes, these 12 defendants that were not found guilty by uh, a supermajority, they do have the right uh, uh, to ask for a reconsideration of their cases. And in some way, uh, this decision caused uh, a very uh, uh, a public outcry in the sense that this will be another case that we w where uh, Brazilian authorities will not be trialed until the end. But in fact, there is a debate if this was a right uh, not in the Constitution, but in uh, the bylaws of the court is a very uh, obsolete uh, uh, disposition at this, uh, this bylaws, but it should take place in this case. So uh, today, the legal community in Brazil is very divided about it, even though the public uh, has a perception that uh, uh, this is uh, a problem. So I will uh, uh, end at this point and we perhaps could uh, debate a little bit more some aspects uh, in, in the questions. I would like, thank you very much, Oscar. I would like now Judge Peter Massetti to uh, make his presentation, his initial presentation. Uh, thank you, Paulo. Uh, an interesting introduction by uh, Professor Villena, and I want to comment on it uh, to some extent compared with how issues like this uh, might arise in the United States. Uh, first of all, let's be clear about what's going on in Brazil. Uh, nobody is asking at this point to be exonerated totally from criminal responsibility. There's a narrow issue before the court, uh, the Supreme Federal Tribunal right now, and that is uh, whether, and for the most part, uh, there can be, uh, there should be some sort of rehearing with regard to what they call formação de quadrilha which is very much like the conspiracy charge in the United States. Under uh, Article uh, 288 of the Brazilian uh, uh, Criminal Code, uh, three people associating together to commit a crime uh, are guilty of, uh, of a violation. In the United States, the conspiracy law, either at the federal or state levels, if two or more people join to commit an unlawful act or to commit a lawful act by unlawful means, that's conspiracy. So it's a comparable uh, idea. And that is what's being challenged. As far as some of the active bribery convictions, they're not before the court. These gentlemen uh, are going to do time one way or another. The question really is, are they going to be in a closed uh, setting with a longer <coughs> term, or are they going to be in what's called a semi-open, semi-aberto situation where they would work, for example, in work camps and so on and so forth. Not to go home on weekends and during the week. They would still be are required to serve time and less time, but not in the hard time, if you will, of a prison. So that's really what's going on. The convictions, if you will, will stay. So insofar as one wants to uh, observe that 
there are convictions that are solid, uh, there will be punitive at some point, uh, whether it's as extensive as, as perhaps one wants. That's, that's the first uh, proposition. The interesting parallels, of course, the United States Supreme Court has no criminal jurisdiction. This is an original jurisdiction case, bear in mind. This is a case where essentially the trial court is the Supreme Court, the Supreme Federal Tribunal. There hasn't been any sort of appeal taken from a lower court decision of guilt. And this is being heard in the Supreme Federal Tribunal. And uh, of course, Americans may wonder, well, what is that all about? Well, why do you have a case being heard originally in the Supreme Court? Because we don't have that kind of original jurisdiction. This is a result of what in Brazil is known as foro privilegiado, or privileged forum. The idea being, and this goes way back to the early times of Brazil, that certain high-level political people uh, can be tried in special courts, only higher courts. And the idea is they should not be tried by ordinary justice the way ordinary people are. People of a higher level, including <coughs> the president or uh, certain officials, either get tried by the Supreme Federal Tribunal or the Superior Tribunal of Justice, or in the case of, for example, mayors by the state tribunals of justice. So it's an interesting concept which we don't have in the United States. In the United States, if you are the president of the United States, or more particularly in my experience, the vice president, you get tried in the United States District Court, the kind of court that I sit in. It happens to be in Maryland that Spiro Agnew got tried for bribery, the District Court. There might be appeals that follow, but the point is they are subject to these high political folks to ordinary justice in our system. The concept of privilege forum in Brazil has been much criticized by many people over a long period of time. I won't get into all that, but it's a very different kind of institution, if you will, that you have to bear in mind as you appreciate what's going on. Now, having said that, if you look at the Supreme Federal Tribunal as a, an essentially a court of first instance here, the real issue, as I see it, is should there be a second look at the decision that they have? Now, think about it. Just uh, step back for a moment and look at our system or other systems around the world. You have courts of first instance that make decisions, and you have appeals to higher courts that can then consider whether there was an error of law in the lower court, something that was missed significantly, and so on, an argument that perhaps wasn't fairly made. Uh, and you have the second level of judges who are looking at the case a second time, the second look concept. It's always been true in the common law system, the Anglo-American system, and even the continental systems that you can always ask the court, particularly the first instance, will you reconsider? Will you rehear this? Uh, there's something that's happened. Now, actually, the United States Supreme Court has done this very, very rarely, I might say, but they do it. There are situations where it has been deemed uh, that a per perhaps a piece of evidence was overlooked, a rule was misapplied, the court decided to hear re-argument, and then issued an opinion that was contrary to the earlier opinion. It's very rare, but the concept of a rehearing is not rare. And particularly, remember, this is not so much an appeal. This is really the court that has offered the first opinion, looking at it a second time. Now, of course, what's interesting, just to sort of go back, there are different kinds of appeals in Brazil. The first one was uh, the embodiment uh, uh, de declaração, uh, the idea of looking to see whether there was some omission or contradiction or something like that, ambiguity that needed to be clear up, cleared up. All of these defendants in this case asked for these embodiments de declaração, and they were all rejected. So for starters, the court appeals, and uh, more or less unanimously, there were a few, I think, which were not unanimous, but the court uh, felt, the ministers, that <clears throat> there were no uh, omissions and ambiguities in the original decision. This idea of embargos infligentes, which is really sort of to see whether there's, it really opens up the reappreciation of the whole case. It's, it's, it's really a, a reappreciation, is, is a somewhat uh, uh, novel in, in the Brazilian system. But here's what's interesting. It does exist in all other courts in Brazil, with the exception, I think, of the Superior Tribunal of Justice. But in lower criminal courts, the idea of going back and sort of seeing, uh, having a second look on infringentes is, as I understand it, possible in Brazil. So in a sense, are you saying, well, it should not be available to a trial court which is hearing a case, such as the Supreme Federal Tribunal in this case? A valid question as to whether they should look at it again. Now, what's the What's the kicker, as we say in, in, in English? Well, you got two new members of the Supreme Federal Tribunal since the last vote. You've got the Minister Barroso and the Minister Zabaski, and who knows where they're going to go? 
that's the issue, and the vote could change. I would say this. I mean, bear in mind, all you got as a decision before the uh, Superior, the S Supreme Federal Tribunal now is the decision to reconsider. It's not actually reconsidering and voting to acquit, to exonerate anybody. All they're saying is, let's listen. And I think, for example, and we don't know how they're going to vote. And when you granted these embargoes infringentis, this, this review, it's wide open. You can reconsider and you could have a vote. I would say, though, I was talking about having read uh, uh, Minister Celso de Mello's opinion with regard to the infringentis. It's not clear that he's going to vote to exonerate these people in any way. All he said is, I think I'm obliged to look at this again. And candidly, if I, I mean, I'm not a Brazilian lawyer, but I do read the law, and I think he's probably right. I mean, I think that, that you have to argue. It's a very narrow legal question, in my view, as I see the Brazilian situation. There was an internal regulation, a bylaw of the Supreme Federal Tribunal, that said that there were these embargoes in Pugentis. And then there was some legislation which some of the ministers said implicitly overruled that, and others said, no, it didn't. And that's a legal issue that I don't know one can get into. Anyway, the, the Supremo has the court, the issue before it right now, and you don't know necessarily what the outcome would be. So I think one has to watch very carefully as to where the Supremo goes. Number one, there are convictions that are going to stay one way or another. And number two, you may still find that the majority upholds the conviction with regard to the, the formation of the gang, as they say, the conspiracy. Formação de quadrilha. That's entirely possible. So that is the way I see the issue, and uh, it's not unreasonable. Uh, th this is a very uh, law-minded court, in my view. These are thoughtful people. I would leave, I suppose, end with one question to you, and then make an observation about parallel. Uh, Minister Diaz Toffoli was the uh, general counsel of the Workers' Party. Uh, he uh, managed President Lula's three campaigns for President Three, in fact, two successful. Uh, he was advocate general of the union, which is like our solicitor general. And uh, a lot of people that uh, he was allied with on a regular basis are among the people making these appeals. Question, should he recuse himself? Should he be in this case at all? Should he be making this decision? Now, we have a law in the United States that applies to our Supreme Court that anybody whose impartiality might be questioned should not sit in the case. Having said that, our members of the Supreme Court can decide whatever they want to for themselves. And recently, with regard to affordable care, the Affordable Care Act, which is probably at the heart of our, of our shutdown of the government right now, but when the issue went before the Supreme Court, some people said, well, Justice Kagan uh, was Solicitor General of the United States when, when uh, Affordable Care was enacted. She shouldn't sit. And other people said on the right, what, but Justice Thomas's wife's been going all over the country talking against the Health Care Act. Why should he sit? And the answer was they both sat uh, because they decided that they could be impartial. So even though one might raise a question about the Minister Diaz Toffoli, and, and one vote may make a difference in this whole business, uh, he has sat, he will sit, and, and that's, I suppose, the stuff for historians and political scientists like Matt Taylor to talk about in the future. So my comments so far. Thank you very much, Judge Massetti. Uh, I would like to invite Judge Marcello to talk, uh, to address the group now, but uh, here I'll put uh, one question. As I understand, the embargoes in Fringentes apply to one of the two charges. Right. There is one charge that stays, and the, 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 the judgment on that is what it is. Uh, so am I right, Judge Marcello, if you could uh, enlighten us a little bit more on that. Yes. Uh, well, I'd like firstly to thank for the invitation to be here talking to you today. And um, Oscar has made a very good briefing of the case, and Judge Peter Masset also had very good emphasized that this kind of appeal, the embargoes infringentes, does not allow the Supreme Court to change the core of the of the trial of the outcome. So uh, I'd just like to add that uh, besides the, the conspiracy, the Formação de Quadrilha, there is also some questions about money laundering involving just a few of the defendants. But uh, in essence, it won't change, as I said, the core of the, of the outcome. So uh, 
in my opinion, this trial will be no matter what a watershed in, in Brazilian criminal justice system because um, it doesn't matter the outcome of the the trial of these embargoes infringentes. Um, some white collar criminals are facing time in jail, some are, are staying more time behind bars, some will stay less time, but anyhow, they, they will face time in jail and it doesn't matter the, the outcome of, of the embargoes infringentes. Just to let you know that now you s we see you and you all look very handsome. <laughs> Thank you very much. You too, Paulo. <laughs> So, um, uh, I would like to say also that uh, Judge Peter Macedo has shown a, a deep knowledge of the case. It makes us very happy. It was ve a very good and very interesting analysis of the facts and of the, the whole political and judicial situation. So, it makes us more comfortable to, to talk about that and see that you have already a, a good knowledge of the case. So, as I said, uh, having that in mind, that it's not possible to change the core of the outcome, I think the greatest meaning of this trial, as I said, is to show that in Brazil, with all the difficulties, some uh, also white collar criminals are infected, uh, or at least we have the expectation that will happen from now on, are prosecuted, tried, and convicted in Brazil. On the other hand, uh, watching this trial that, as Professor Oscar said, it was broadcasted through the whole country, uh, people, Brazilian people, and I mean lay people, regular people, could have an idea of the absurd uh, complexity of our criminal justice. It is weird, it is too complex, and it is, at my point of view, completely outdated. The, um, the possibility, the jurisdiction to politicians uh, directly, they, they are directly originally judged from the Supreme Court is something that is, as my point of view, unjustifiable. No country in the world has, to my knowledge, a judicial system in which so many people are able to prosecute it and judge it originally by the Supreme Court. The system does not work in Brazil less than 5% of the cases does get to a final decision. This special jurisdiction also applies not, all, not, not always within, in the Supreme Court, but in higher courts to governors, mayors, ministers, judges, prosecutors, and other authorities. So it simply doesn't work. It is clearly outdated and goes against the public responsibility in Brazil and should be uh, as soon as possible changed. And uh, there, there goes another observation. It is just the tip of the iceberg. A regular criminal case has to be judged in Brazil by four different courts, not to mention the possible appeals that can be filed in each of these courts. If you consider on one hand that taking all the possibilities of appeals into account, a criminal case is virtually endless in Brazil. And on the other hand, that as a rule, nobody can go to jail before the complete exhaustion of all the appeals due to the understanding of the Supreme Court about the presumption of innocence. We have the formula of impunity. So um, I will advance some of the conclusions that I take from this, this trial, and we can go further later. But uh, as I see, as I said, there are positive uh, things to consider about this trial, but we can see also that we need urgently to simplify and downsize our judicial legal framework, especially our appeal system. And one of the immediate possibilities that doesn't require uh, a change of the law is a better use of the institute of, that we call here repercussão geral. Uh, it, it is not uh, related, directly related with these mensa law cases because it only applies to the cases that are, are judged from the lower courts. But that is, uh, there is similar with the writ of certiorari horari that you have there and uh, that allows the Supreme Court to have some, some grade of, or a high grade of discretionary to decide 
uh, if they will or they will not uh, judge, uh, for example, a, a criminal case, if they will receive or not an appeal. And from from my, in my opinion, the Supreme Court in Brazil has already uh, the same kind of of uh, tool, but they don't use it as they should. And the other thing that seems to me that it's very has become very, very clearly from this trial is that the Supreme Court should be urgently transformed in an authentic uh, authentic constitutional court dealing only with constitutional matters. It is not possible that a country that a Supreme Court from a country stops for one year just deciding from a criminal case instead of dealing with lots of other important constitutional matters. It shows in my opinion very clearly that this kind of cases should be judged from the law by the lower courts so the Supreme Court can be a real constitutional court and um, focus on what should be their real job. Well that those would be my my first considerations. I thank you again for the opportunity and I I stay here to further questions. Thank you. Marcelo, I would like now to invite after uh, listening to well, two judges, one uh, legal uh, scholar. I would like to ask Matthew how all this all looks from the perspective of political science. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much, Paulo, for the invitation to be here. Uh, it's really an honor to be here with these three uh, distinguished lawyers and judges. I'm a political scientist, which means that in addition to not being as well paid, um, I'm probably <laughs> best equipped to discuss the legal issues. So I, I'll try to uh, touch on what's important here, but I, I want to take the picture perhaps a little bit broader uh, and talk a little bit about accountability uh, more broadly in Brazil. Um, you know, I think we've heard a lot about the, the actual Mensalão trial. I would argue that the Mensalão trial is really the exception that proves the rule. Uh, and the, the rule is the courts are the biggest accountability bottleneck in Brazil at this point. Uh, in a review of 10 major scandals that have taken place over the past two decades, uh, journalists at one of Brazil's major <coughs> newspapers found that of 841 defendants who were accused in these 10 uh, scandals, only 55 had been convicted, so about 6%. And only nine had received a final conviction, so just over 1% of these. Um, the, the Mensa loan will probably be decided uh, next year. Uh, that means that it won't be decided until nine years after the scandal broke. Uh, and somewhat ironically, this means that the trial actually moved, around, uh, moved along pretty quickly by Brazilian standards. And so, uh, as we think about accountability in Brazil, it's hard to avoid the conclusion that the courts really are, at the moment, the key uh, bottleneck. And I don't have a lot of time to talk about what's changed in Brazil uh, in terms of federal accountability, and that's what I study at the federal level. But if you think about what's happened over the past 30 years among uh, federal accountability agencies like the Polícia Federal, the uh, Comptroller General's Office, the CGU. Uh, when you think about what's happened with civil society, the creation of groups like Transparencia Brasil, Instituto Ethos, Movimento Voto Consciente, Amarribo, all of these groups that have grown and really become very active players. Uh, when you think about the expansion of transparency, partly as a result of things that have nothing to do with accountability, like fiscal reform, uh, the creation of the fiscal responsibility law, uh, the creation of a transparency law. Uh, when you think about what's happened to the Ministerio Público, which has been the prosecutor's office, which has become much stronger, much more autonomous in the last 30 years. You think about the creation of the Comptroller General's office, the CGU. You think about policies like the uh, National Anti-Money Money Laundering Strategy, the ENCLA, which brings together a lot of government agencies to try to discuss uh, how to improve accountability, and they've actually done a great deal to improve uh, oversight. Uh, you think about international agreements, like agreements uh, through the UN um, uh, Convention Against Corruption, through the OAS. 
uh, the, the voluntary submission of the Brazilian federal government to uh, oversight from below as part of these treaties, there's been just an enormous growth of accountability uh, efforts within the federal bureaucracy. And this continued, and I think uh, to avoid you know, any sort of partisanship here, I would say that the Lula government inherited a lot of this, but it also deepened a great deal of this reform, and it's, it's continuing. Uh, Lula appointed very dynamic leaders to, to head the, the Justice Ministry, to head the federal police, to head the CGU. There's been new leadership in the, the Tribunal de Contas, which is the accounting body. The number of personnel in accountability agencies has more than doubled at the federal level uh, since 1989. Within the federal police since 2003, you've seen a 50% expansion in the federal police and I think a fairly active effort to root out the most corrupt uh, police. The ANCLA, this anti-money laundering strategy, produces uh, lots of important uh, policy changes that are marginal. They take place at the margin, they're very incremental, but they nonetheless add up over 30 years to uh, a really important change. And the number of civil servants, just to give you one example of how this has gotten better, the number of civil servants who have been removed from their posts or expelled from malfeasance has more than doubled in the past seven years, as has the number of audits <coughs> undertaken uh, within the federal government. So I'm only talking about the federal government. The picture at the state level is not necessarily as good. And there are, of course, problems like friction between the agencies, um, the abuse of power by places like the COAFI, which is the Financial Activities Oversight Body, or the Federal Police. But what we see is that despite all of these improvements, we run up against the courts. And, um, you know, I don't want to underplay the importance of the Mensa Lounge. The Mensa Lounge really was a very big deal. The fact that they not only uh, convicted 25, but they actually also absolved uh, the other defendants, this is very important. Uh, this was a major trial, and um, there were, of course, debates over the prevailing legal rules, but the, the STF, by and large, uh, has done its job in a way that I think uh, most uh, neutral observers will agree uh, has preserved the rule of law. But, again, this is a case which proves the rule. It's the exception that proves the rule. Uh, we see here uh, the use of legal rules that date back to the 1940s, a plethora of laws that are on the books that were developed under uh, different political regimes. That leads to some uncertainty, for example, about the embargoes infringentes. Uh, in many corruption cases, not necessarily in this one, we have the possibility of these recurring interlocutory appeals, uh, procedural delays to run out the statute of limitations. Um, one thing that I think we have to remember in Brazil that makes special standing so important, this possibility of the foro privilegiado so important, is that there are 90 million court cases underway in Brazil at any given moment, and that's not, you know, larger than the U.S., but what's very different from the U.S. is that the congestion at the top of the judicial pyramid is much, much uh, higher. And so overall, what we see in Brazil, and I think this is understandable in light of Brazil's authoritarian history and the return to democracy, is a decision to privilege what they call the amplo de, uh, direito de, de defesa, uh, the, the broad right to defense, uh, over perhaps other criteria. So maximizing appeals, maxi maximizing the possibility of appeal over efficiency or perhaps equality. And one of the most important considerations that I think comes out of this is the delays of the courts make it very difficult to remove corrupt players from the political game um, in, a, in an efficient way. And so they continue to behave, uh, or it's possible to, to have corrupt networks that continue to operate uh, over the long haul. So the SPF is extraordinarily poorly equipped to hear criminal cases. Um, as others have mentioned, you know, it's taken us seven years to begin to hear this case. Uh, 63,000 pages of evidence, 600 witnesses, uh, somewhere between 50 and 60 sessions by the full SDF um, 
uh, Judge Marcel, I think, mentioned the, the fact that this means that they can't work on other things. They cannot work on constitutional appeals. Uh, Celso de Mello's vote last week on the embargoes in Finian James took him two hours to read. This is, I think, uh, a sign of, of some of the issues. And, and yeah, so... I think, it, I think it was more like three. Okay, well, so, you know, I'm glad to hear um, some of those who preceded me uh, talking about the need for reform. Unfortunately, it's been very difficult uh, for there to be any reform. And as a foreigner, when I look at Brazil, this is what strikes me most is it's very clear that the courts are one of the chief bottlenecks, if not the chief bottleneck, to accountability for corruption. And uh, yet calls for reform since 2004 have been relatively uh, mild. Now, um, uh, I think, again, trying to be apartisan here, there are uh, reasons that reform is not desired by anybody. Uh, including the fact that there is a mental loan, so-called mental loan minero, uh, that's still to be heard. There are plenty of scandals to go around for all parties. Recently, we have the Sao Paulo allegations, uh, uh, accusations against Delta Construção, and, and so forth and so on. And this takes me to my second conclusion, which is what I expect is likely to happen is an increasing politicization of the courts. Uh, we've already seen this in constitutional matters. I, I think that in accountability issues, in anti-corruption issues, uh, it's very possible that we'll see much greater politicization of court appointments, and we've certainly seen much more careful vetting of uh, justices from here on out, uh, at, well, in the last five years. Um, and some of this uh, relates to something that Judge Massetti mentioned, which is the fact that all of these uh, decisions were, or all of the deliberations were made on live TV, and that uh, makes the STF somewhat of a, a lightning rod. So just to conclude, I'm very optimistic about the construction of accountability in Brazil, especially as we look back over the last three decades. Um, we should be very optimistic about how democracy has changed beliefs about social status, about elite privileges, about clientelism, and about corruption. But I think uh, any serious analysis needs to come back to the role that we expect the courts to play uh, and to their role as the largest bottleneck in fighting corruption. Thank you, Matthew. Well, with that, I would like uh, to, unless some of the speakers have a, a quick observation to make, I would like to start the Q&A. And uh, we agreed that we will have uh, one question from here, from the Wilson Center, and followed by a question from Getúlio Vargas. But yes, uh, Judge Massachi, uh, please. Uh, a couple of quick points that I'd, I'd like to make. Number one, bear in mind that only 12 of the 25 people have filed these embargoes and transgenders. The, the other uh, 13 or so, or maybe less, they're ready to go to jail. That's been done already, so there's nothing pending anymore. That, those appeals are over. Another important point to, uh, to bear in mind. The, uh, the second thing that I, I want to say is that uh, with regard to uh, the issue of statute of limitations, and for this I owe a debt to Dr. Luciana Mendes, who is working with me, who is a prosecutor from Sao Paulo. Uh, it's a little bit different with regard to limitations in Brazil, because if you are not charged within a certain period of time, or your sentence is not imposed within a certain period of time, you're out free. Uh, limitations run, prescrição. It doesn't happen in the United States. Once you're charged, it may take 10 years, you get to a result, but then you go to jail and you do your time. And while the appeal is pending, you go to jail. You're not free. Once you're convicted in the trial court, the presumption of innocence goes away. You might be able to turn it around, but you go to jail. Take the example of Governor Marvin Mandel of Maryland. He went to jail for three years, and then his conviction was reversed. He went back and became governor again. So that's the way it works here. Uh, we sort of a uh, there's no time for uh, for waiting around. If you're guilty, you're guilty. So. That's the final thing. I, I, some other time, uh, uh, Matt, I want to talk to you about judicial reform in Brazil. I have a different take on it than you because I've been, been doing this for a while and I've seen a lot of movement in the last 45 years or so, but we could talk about that another time. But the other interesting issue is, yes, 
there is always open debate by the ministers on the Supreme Federal Tribunal, right in public presence. Our Supreme Court doesn't do that, obviously. Everything is secret, and you don't know the decision until it's announced. You know, all you know is the uh, press reports on what the arguments are. Enough said. Well, thank you very much, uh, Oscar or Judge Marcelli, unless you have some observations. Could we go straight to questions? Please. Uh, just, just one observation regarding one point that uh, Justice Massetti said, and perhaps I, I little bit disagree, is regarding the presence of agravo, uh, embargos infringentes in every level of the, the court system. It's, uh, he is right in this point, but there is uh, uh, a specificity here, which is uh, courts, like state supreme courts, which are large courts with more than 100 members, they are divided in several cameras. So normally a case is trial by one of these cameras. And then you have the embargoes in presentes when you have a divergence inside of the camera to bring the case to what we call the plenary of the court. So it's not a common thing to have an embargoes in presentes uh, uh, from a decision of 11 judges to the same 11 judges. So that's just a, a little uh, uh, specific thing that perhaps we should uh, bear in mind. So that's why it caused some debate if it was a, a case to have this appeal at the Supreme Court. I'm not saying the Supreme Court decided wrongly, not at all. I'm just saying that is, it is of the nature of this appeal to solve problems when you have a section of a larger court deciding uh, uh, the case. And just another uh, paradox, perhaps, um, I'm now uh, uh, reacting to what uh, my friend Matthew said, is that we all criticize the, the privilege forum for many years in Brazil, and I fully agree with Marcelo that this is uh, a thing that doesn't fit with a democratic society. But it was the privileged forum, the first one to grant a very strong case again, uh, against corruption in Brazil. So that is part of the paradox. It's really an exception. Uh, uh, it is a bad exception, but it is an exception that perhaps will uh, destabilize the system that is not functioning at the court level as uh, Matthew correctly posed. Okay, thank you, Oscar. I will ask uh, people uh, asking questions to please uh, identify themselves, and we will have, uh, we'll start on this end. Please go ahead. Thank you. <coughs> My name is Christina Serna. <coughs> I'm an adjunct law professor at Georgetown. Um, I come to this uh, meeting with zero knowledge about this case and the Brazilian legal system. And I want to thank the four presenters for really excellent and fascinating presentations. Um, I've read a little about the case in the press, and what, what I'd like to know is, how did this case ever arise? Since President Rousseff is a hand-picked successor by President Lula, and the idea of having a successor government bring a criminal case uh, for corruption against, clearly it involved President Lula and his administration. What, what was the role of President Lula in this case? Um, who are the 12? These are 12 members of Congress. Is that why they got the privileged forum? And the other 25 are carried along because they're involved in a so-called conspiracy? And also, what kind of sentences did those who were convicted get? Thank you. Who would like to take that one? Well, Oscar, do you do that? Marcelo could start. Well, okay. firstly, right. um, I think that this prosecution can be credited to something that uh, Matthew said, that is the autonomy of the Ministerio Público. Actually, it, it had really worked in this case, and they, they felt no pressure, actually, Probably there was some pressure to not take it longer, but it worked well. The Polícia Federal has also worked, uh, and uh, and the case has been brought on. And now, could you explain what the Ministerio Público is and how it relates, for instance, to 
the, in the United States? What's the equivalence? Okay. Good. The U.S. Attorney of the United States. Okay, go ahead, Marcel. Okay. Oh, just, just one thing. It's interesting, the, the, the attorney office, but the, the difference is that it is a career. To, today we have around 15,000 members of the Ministerio Público that are not appointed by any politician. They pass in a very hard exam, perhaps is the, the hardest uh, 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 public job to, to get in Brazil besides being a judge. So they are very insular. Uh, to political pressures, just this is a, a difference between the U.S. and, and Brazil. Yeah, the, they are uh, called the the fourth power besides judiciary, executive, and uh, and the the legislative power. So that would be the the first question, and the second uh, was about the the other the other people that the other defendants that are are being accused um, together with the the congressmen. Um, that is correct, Christina. These these other people they are being charged, and they are being prosecuted in the Supreme Court because it, uh, they were in the same conspiracy as the the congressmen. So the Supreme Court in Brazil has this understanding that they should be all um, judged together, and um, and, the, and the, I, I think the the role of Lula. You asked in the in the in the last part of your question. Well, I I think that uh, although he had made some 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 comments about the case, he had in my in my point of view he had uh, behaved properly. He didn't he didn't uh, had intromised. He didn't had many made any pressure over the investigation. So the institutions had really worked in this case and it it go it, it had went forwards without interruptions uh, just uh, i will ask uh, i hope judge Masari to summarize at least to highlight there is a former chief of staff to president lula jose de Rousseau de oliveira who was uh, being prepared to run for the presidency after the second term. He is the principal figure in this. There is a former president of the Workers' Party, was a federal congressman. Uh, there is the former speaker of the House, also a member of uh, the uh, Workers' Party. Those are the, if you could, uh, if you would, Peter, give us a yeah. little bit. Let me, I actually, uh, again, thanks to Luciana Mendes who prepared this chart for me. I'll just give you a quick example of who, who was who and what they got. Uh, Jose Ducero was, Ducero was the uh, ex-minister uh, chief of, uh, of staff for the, uh, for the Lula government, uh, and he was found guilty of conspiracy and active bribery, got done 10 years. Uh, Dilubio Suarez was the ex-treasurer of the Workers' Party. Uh, he was also found guilty of conspiracy and uh, active uh, solicitation of bribe, and he got uh, nine years. Jose Yanguinu was the ex-president, national president of the Workers' Party, also charged with and found guilty of formation of uh, uh, the gang, which is conspiracy, active uh, bribery, and he got uh, seven years. Marcos Valerio, uh, public relations person uh, connected with the scheme, was found guilty of a number of things, including uh, conspiracy, active bribery, theft, and money laundering, and so on. And, I can't even total the numbers because they get really high and double figures. But that's an idea of who was involved. Main point, they are members of the Workers' Party. The president is a member of the Workers' Party. Lula was of the Workers' Party, an interesting concept. Paulo, we are not hearing the question. But, uh, we need the microphone here. Why would be the government Bribing. Members of its own party. Wouldn't members of the party tend to vote in favor of what the president is? Of, of it wasn't bribing party? its own party. It was bribing another party ah. to join in the coalition. These are the bribers, not the bribees. Just, just for context, let me explain. In Brazil, uh, the government is organized around what we describe as presidential, uh, uh, as uh, presidentialist by coalition. Okay, uh, the president is supported by about 10 political parties. We have 
you know, 36, 26, I don't know. It's a big country, we need a lot of political parties. Okay, so, uh, what happens is that uh, the president, in order to govern, has to f keep this coalition together, and it takes normally, depending on the issue at hand, uh, the president has to have the allegiance of those, the members of those parties uh, and normally has to negotiate that in the morning and renegotiate that in the afternoon depending on the issue and the price may go up. Now, uh, what seems to have been the case here is that instead of doing what other presidents did, which is to negotiate, to use patronage, to use whatever, in that sense it's not very different from here or any other country. Uh, it looks like there was, and this was the charge, that there was a conspiracy inside of the government to make this more efficient, let's say, by paying monthly stipends to members of allied parties to guarantee their allegiance, their support. This, Paulo, therefore, the expression meant salon. Paulo, just for the, you know, for the sake of the debate, uh, let me give a little bit the, the, the view of the defendants, uh, which was, well, this was not bribery. Uh, we were part of a coalition, and this money came to us as part of uh, a scheme to help us campaigning. So they are not paying the votes. The government was finding money. You can say that there was an illegality on this, but the money was not uh, uh, an exchange for votes, but was a money sent to the parties so they could do their campaign next year, just to, to, to see how it works. Because they were part of the coalition. And one member of this coalition, one very important politician, uh, had an, a disagreement with the chief of staff, and he was the one, was the whistleblower. He was the one who brought all the scheme uh, to, uh, uh, to the public. And, uh, and, and those involved in the scheme defend themselves, saying this was an unorthodox way of raising funds for the campaign. Just, uh, yeah. and, and the court didn't accept this uh, view, That's, uh, but this was the perspective of the defendants which the Supreme Court didn't buy. And the congressman that started all that responds by the name Jefferson. I'm sorry. Uh, a question from, uh, a, a question from uh, Fundação Getúlio Vargas, please. I have a question. Uh, do they hear me? Yes, yes. just speak uh, louder. Yes. yes. Uh, I'm Pedro, I'm a student in Fundação Getúlio Vargas, a law student. I'll probably leave the a bit aside the debate regarding uh, Mensalo and, and my question uh, revolves around a comparison system, comparison between the United States and Brazil. It's a very disputable whether the fact that we've got a broadcasted Supreme Court is actually something good or bad. Uh, normally in Brazil we would see people gathering in front of television to see football matches but recently we've been speak we've seen people gathering in front of the television to see uh, a judicial trial. So one could claim that, well, this this could have a sort of a uh, educational purpose. But I, I, I'd really like to, to, to know uh, what you, sir, uh, Professor and, and Judge, understand how do you see this, a court, a Supreme Court, which is broadcasted uh, the debate between uh, the judges is broadcasted. How do you see this, the impacts, and compared to the Supreme Court of the United States, which, uh, are, which is completely the opposite, with, meaning even the debate is not uh, publicly revealed and only the decision. So how do you see this question of our Supreme okay. Court being broadcasted? Yeah, I'll ask Matthew. Remember, it, there are trials that are broadcasted in uh, uh, the United States. Uh, some of you may remember the, the trial of a famous football player called O.J. Simpson. Yeah. Uh, and but the, so you were right the, in the Supreme Court. There has been a debate about that, right, Matthew? Yeah. So I guess uh, I'll take your question more broadly. I think that the the issue of whether it's televised or not, maybe we can set aside. But I think that the the larger issue is the politicization of the SDPF 
um, because the Supreme Federal Tribunal in Brazil, because of this problem that I think uh, Judge uh, Marcelo pointed to, the, the lack of use of the repercussão geral, the lack of a writ of certiorari, um, it means that the apex of the judicial system has to hear everything. And so, for example, the SDF uh, receives somewhere between 80,000 and 100,000 cases a year. Um, and when I wrote this uh, one time for an American political science review, I got a rejection outright saying, this is impossible, this person doesn't know their numbers. And, um, you know, this means that the, the courts have to address a number of issues that are politically difficult. Uh, some of these issues are constitutional. But in the mental health case, and I think increasingly from here on out, they will be criminal as well. Uh, and so whether it's televised, I think you're right, whether it's televised or not may not be the most important issue. And in fact, televising it may be educational. But the fact of the matter is that the STF has, as uh, uh, Oscar has written, you know, been uh, pushed into uh, a very important political role. Yeah, but, uh, Judge Mossetti enlighten us about, because there was a debate some 10, 15 years ago about whether to allow the revision. There was first about Congress, then it was finally allowed, 20 years ago maybe, and then on the Supreme Court. How was the debate and why they finally decided not to? Well, here, yeah, here you have to distinguish between federal justice and state justice. In the federal courts, uh, cameras are not allowed. There was an, there's an experimental program in some of the federal courts of appeal that allow arguments, but not in the district courts. And that is a flat policy, and it's not going to change. Some of the state courts, they have their own option. They can televise their state proceedings, and some do, California being most prominent among them. Uh, and it, it, I might say, obviously, the O.J. Simpson case is an example of how bad televised proceedings can be. You had prosecutors and defenders who were grandstanding and you had a judge who really couldn't handle the press and so on and so forth. It really made the whole trial look rather pathetic. Uh, and the, the general rule, I think, across the country is the courts just don't want it. They don't think that televising the proceedings are conducive to uh, a, a fair trial. Having said that, though, we're talking in this instance about televising proceedings of the Supreme Federal Tribunal. And I see that really as a a very interesting educational opportunity. It is the procedure of the court in Brazil not to have closed door sessions about how the case is going to be resolved. They are, someone will be designated as the relator, the reporter on the case. They will write a decision and then that will be openly debated where the public will sit in. That's rather intriguing. Uh, and it does in fact, uh, it does in fact invite criticism but it also educates. Now, let me, since we are talking about educa the education impact of that, let's just run a little try, a little uh, Q and A demonstration here of the students. There, I assume you all, you, most of you guys are law students and very young people. I think we have also some students here. Uh, please, uh, the third, thirty and under. If you are more, if you are old, more than thirty years old, you are not supposed to respond to this question. A show of hands. <laughs> Do you think that televising uh, judicial procedures is a good idea or a bad idea? Show of hands, please. Which? Which one? Good. It's a good idea. Who, who, who thinks it's a good idea? Raise your hand. How about here? How about here? Oh. Well, he, I think. Uh, here it may be a tie, but there it looks like most people do not like the idea. Yes. So let's have a question uh, let me, from here. Uh, Paulo, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I was surprised by, by the result uh, in any case. So since I'm a little bit older than 30, uh, no, it's interesting uh, what uh, uh, Matthew said first. Brazilian courts decide in public. This is a constitutional uh, uh, clause, so every act of the court is supposed to be public. So in any uh, event, a small court in a little city and the Supreme Court, they all deliberate in public. So this is part of our Republican tradition, and uh, I see no sign of, 
of, of change on this, and which is a good thing in terms of public scrutiny of, of transparency. We are, I think, very happy with that. Uh, what happened with the Supreme Court is that in the case of the impeachment of former President Collor, uh, people were so eager to uh, know how the court would be uh, deliberating this case and uh, that the president of the court at that time uh, uh, allowed to be televised. And since then, in major cases, the Supreme Court w cases were televised. So but there is uh, this, this constitutional principle that every act of the government should be public and the judiciary also. And that's how it became uh, televised. My uh, friend, professor here at the, the, our law school, Dow Gias, a very important criminal lawyer, said that perhaps in criminal cases you should be acting differently because you could have uh, a, a, a public perception that is, uh, uh, would influence the justices or the jury. Uh, but uh, I would say that in other cases, television uh, made uh, a very good impact on the Supreme <coughs> Court uh, in the last 20 years uh, that were established. Disagreeing with my students. Well, let me just add one thing that I find personally very interesting here. Obviously, all deliberations of the Supreme Court, it is there obviously open, they're public, but uh, the space is not, uh, you know, uh, there are limits of space, so people are uh, by, they first come, first served, I think. But what in, what in is the Supreme, process? In our Supreme Court, the decision is already made. They are, they may hear argument, and okay. they may answer questions on argument, but then they deliver opinion. Yeah, no, what I find personally very interesting as a journalist is that the decisions of the Supreme uh, There is in journalism in the United States a specialized group of people that are journalists that interpret Supreme Court decisions. And there are some absolutely amazing texts and amazing... The, there is uh, on PBS, on the TV Educativa equivalent here, uh, there are a couple of people that are absolutely outstanding in translating uh, to everybody what the decisions were, what are their implications, what they mean. And, and, and this is probably something that uh, we uh, have, will have to develop in this, is to translate the rule of law uh, uh, to people. And uh, it's a major challenge for journalists also. Uh, we, we need a question from here, Steve. Um, Tom O'Keefe from the uh, Tom. <laughs> that's right. Uh, Tom O'Keefe from the uh, Foreign Service Institute. Um, I have a question directed to uh, Marcelo and Cavalli. The statistic that you quoted that less than five percent of uh, criminal cases go up through the four um, procedural steps before there's a final conviction. Is that uh, across the board all criminal cases in Brazil? Or is that just cases that end up in uh, these uh, foro privilegiados? And the other question I have too is, those who are convicted in a foro privilegiado, do they end up going to a regular prison or is there a special prison system for them as well too? Thanks. Okay, first question, this is statistics is referred only to those who have foro privilegiado not only in the Supreme Court, but also in the other courts. As I mentioned, Speak for example, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong microphone. Um, so the, these statistics are referred to for a privilegiado, not to the regular cases, but not only for the Supreme Court cases, because as I mentioned before, governors and uh, other authorities have also for a privilegiado in other higher courts. So it only applies to for a privilegiado. And referring to the second question, uh, it should be in the end of the, the criminal cases when there is not, uh, when there are exhausted all possible appeals, then there is not a different, there should be not a different uh, kind of jail to these people. But uh, we've, we've heard about some movements here to, to
to keep these this people uh, separated from from the other but there there is a rule of law that allows some some kind of people during the the criminal judgment when they are arrested not to be together with regular criminals but once the criminal case is ended then there's no more this this diction, distinction sorry okay a uh, question from uh, from Paulo uh, there is one in the back there if you could, either you shout or you yeah. <laughs> Victor, I'm also a student here at FGV, and uh, my question also concerns the comparative system. Uh, as we discussed, the, polit the politicians in Brazil and the Brazilian system are uh, tried to, by Supreme Court, uh, which is not well equipped to do so. I uh, would like to understand how a politician trial occurs in the U.S. system. Do they ever reach the, the Supreme Court? Okay. It's about the nomination process, the Supreme Court, and he is uh, asking whether politicians no sorry no, paul is I that what it is no no, no. the uh, question Oscar, was repeat the question yeah i think the question was how a politician would be trial yeah, in the u.s system. system if a senator or, or a member of parliament uh, and if the case would arrive in the supreme court at, at, at a certain point politician Politician is treated like any other criminal defendant. If a politician is tried, uh, charged with a federal crime, they would be first tried in the United States District Court for the district uh, that they are in. I am a United States District Court judge, and I would hear the case, whether it's the president or vice president or a senator. That person could then appeal the conviction, and they would have an appeal of right to the next level court, which is like the Federal Regional Tribunals of Brazil to the Court of Appeals, whether the United States Supreme Court would hear the case would be up to the Supreme Court because they have uh, what is called discretionary review, what you in Brazil call repercussão geral, and they may or may not hear the decision. And that's the end of it. There's nothing more to be talked about. There's just absolutely no different treatment for a politician, regardless of the level that that person served with regard to the criminal justice most of the cases against politicians do get tried in federal court and the fear is that the state courts particularly if they are state politicians may be too biased in favor the federal courts are less uh, are considered more impartial but that's the short answer thank you very much uh, i now we have a question from here uh, yes uh, and that's right and tom apologies because you know the problem after knowing people for 25 years. The problem is that with age we start forgetting everything. <laughs> I used to forget. Tom, dear, uh, Tom's name, my dear friend. Uh, hi, my name is Tim Radout. I'm a fellow at the German Marshall Fund. And my question is also, it's more for the Brazilians, but it's comparative. Um, as I understand, the Ministerio Público is enshrined in the Constitution in a way that no U.S. The U.S. Uh, attorney's office is not, and that's, I believe, it's, uh, that's why it's considered sort of the fourth pillar in the Brazilian system. And there was also, with the PEC 27, the uh, proposal to amend the Constitution that was essentially tabled in June amid the protests, um, was that, and I believe that the amendment would have weakened the military people. And I was wondering if you talk more about that, how this fits into the trial and Okay. Yes, uh, you are right. The, the Ministerio Público is a very peculiar institution. You have state Ministerio Público and you have the federal Ministerio Público. So you have each state has its own Ministerio Público. Uh, there is an uh, interesting and important difference from the Brazilian Public Attorney, uh, Attorney General. Uh, office and, and most of the Attorney General Office around the globe, which is it's not only uh, active on criminal cases, okay? So the, 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 the Ministerio Público is in a mixture of an ombudsman and an uh, ouvidor because it takes cases in several areas, uh, like uh, environmental law, uh, like consumer law, indigenous people, so it protects 
the social interests of people. So it is extremely powerful uh, because the Brazilian constitution is very generous on the rights it uh, uh, grants, and the Ministerio Público could bring cases on behalf of the society. So all the class actions in all these areas that I said are, are Ministerio Público that brings to the, to the court. So it is a powerful institution. They are insulate, uh, constitutionally insulate from, from politicians. Uh, their members are, uh, are co-opted through this meritocratic uh, process, through a, a, a public contest. Uh, you could have 50 places for federal prosecutors and 25,000 uh, lawyers and young lawyers around the country uh, 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 doing these tests. So uh, it's very insulated. In the top, uh, they promote an election and uh, provide a list of three of their own members to be uh, 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 set by the president as the, 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 the general attorney. So the general attorney is select by the president in a list of three members of the Ministerio Público uh, that were elected. And then the Senate uh, approved this. So uh, if you take this case of Mensalão, uh, the, the person who brought the case against m important members of parliament, they uh, 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 were in fact selected by the president, but through this filter of the, institu the institutional filter. So this is one point just to, to, to understand uh, uh, how the Ministry of Public functions. Uh, well, regarding the PEC 37, which was a, 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 a draft amendment to the Constitution that was posed, then is another dispute. Is a dispute between the federal police and the Ministerio Público, because uh, there is a debate that investigation would be a monopoly of the police. And um, members of the police are saying that uh, the Ministerio Público are overstepping the jurisdiction of the police because they are doing their own investigation through uh, new uh, equipment called Inquérito Civil, a, a civilian inquiry or something like this. Uh, so uh, the PEC 37, it was a debate about this. Uh, would the investigation process be kept as a monopoly of the police or the Ministerio Público uh, would be allowed to do it? In the end, uh, what you have is that uh, since the, 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 the packet was not approved, grace to the, uh, the pressures of the streets, uh, so uh, uh, the decision is that the Ministerio Público is uh, a, a kind of competing with the federal police by also uh, producing investigation. I don't know if yeah, you, uh, you want to correct me. Yeah. Now, uh, one clarification that maybe Judge Massetti said, here in the United States, my impression, at least at the federal level, is that uh, the police works under the guidance of the prosecutor. Is, is that what it is? Well, when you're talking about federal, there's, there's really no federal police. You're talking about the FBI and all the different law enforcement agencies at the federal level. Sure, at the state level where there are police, they are always under the direction of the prosecutor prosecutor, there may be things that happen on the street and the police become aware of a crime and bring it to the prosecutor, but investigations, the whole decision to prosecute is entirely in the hands of the, uh, of the prosecutor. In fact, prosecutors can choose not to prosecute what is clearly a crime. That's how broad their discretion is. Okay, question from... Let me just, let me just yes. recall one thing. It, it, uh, it's true there are differences between a member of the Ministerio Público in Brazil and a member of the U.S. Attorney in the United States. Uh, but it is also true that the Department of Justice, which is the main center where our U.S. attorneys work, is responsible for prosecuting uh, environmental crimes and all the other kinds of crimes that uh, you find in, uh, uh, prosecuted by the Ministry of Public in Brazil. And maybe the Environmental Protection Agency that brings the case, or the Food and Drug Administration. I mean, there are all these public interest prosecutions are carried on in the United States. Separate word. It's true that there has been some political influence over the years in the Department of Justice, particularly during the Reagan and George, uh, George uh, and W's watch. But for the most part, there's a tradition of independence in the U.S. 
Department of Justice with career prosecutors who are committed to, how should I say, doing the right thing. Uh, and so th they aren't really totally under the control of, of the administration. Well, a uh, question from uh, from Assange to please. I have one, please. Uh, please. My name is Denis Guimarães, and I am a former graduate student from Fundação Getúlio Vargas. Uh, I have a question about the possible role of the Organization of American States uh, in this trial. Uh, Paulo Sotero uh, mentioned the, the role of José Dirceu uh, in the case, the former uh, chief of the civil cabinet of, of the Lula administration. And uh, José, José Dirceu uh, has been stating that after the, the case uh, is finished in the Brazilian Supreme Court, uh, he will try to appeal uh, for a, a kind of a, re a, a human rights review uh, that could take place in the Organization of American States. I would like to know if uh, one of the panelists would be able to to make a, a comment on the, on the legal feasibility of, of this idea, of this strategy. Thanks. Uh, actually, we have a person here in this room that knows I'm sorry? a lot about this. And, uh, and the idea here is that after this, is this process, this the trial ends, that uh, uh, the case would be brought to the Inter-American Human Rights Commission. And Chris, could you like to know something? Sure. Um, I should add, I recently retired from 33 years at the OAS, most of which was with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Uh, for the case to come before the commission, the victims would have to allege a violation of specific rights set forth in the American Convention on Human Rights. Uh, but should they be able to do that, alleging, say, for example, violation of due process or access to justice or whatever complaint they have about the proceedings, they are certainly free to present their case before the Inter-American Commission. And since Brazil is a state party to the American Convention and has accepted the compulsory jurisdiction of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, which sits in San Jose, Costa Rica, the case could eventually come before this court and the court could issue a legally binding judgment in the case. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Well, uh, the context of this is also interesting because there was in not long ago, and I wrote about this a bit, there was a decision by the Inter-American uh, Human Rights Commission uh, to, uh, on the regarding involving violation or of indigenous rights in the area where the Belo Monte Hydro Plant is being built. And uh, the decision by the commission, uh, it was called a what? What is it? A precautionary measure, and as a precautionary measure, the commission uh, basically uh, told Brazil to stop construction of Belo Monte. And I don't know if you there in Sao Paulo remember what happened, uh, but there was a very, very visceral reaction from the part of the president, Dilma Rousseff, uh, and the relationship became very strained to the point that Brazil for a while uh, did what uh, the Brazilian government had few months before criticized the United States from doing when the United States stopped payment to UNESCO. For a while we stopped payment to the OES because we didn't like what the Inter-American Human Rights Commission was doing. In this instance, I think, and I said that in another uh, place, I think that uh, the, obviously the commission is of a political commission. It's not the commission of nations, like it's not like the UN Human Rights Committee, which is of nations. It's a commission of citizens, of experts. There is one Brazilian there, actually Paulo Vanucci, who is a former human rights uh, minister in Brazil, uh, who succeeded Paulo Sergio Pinheiro, a former human rights minister in Brazil. And uh, it is a politically touchy thing, 
because of the perception in Brazil, the, the political in, uh, political perception about this case, the political content of this case, I personally believe that the commissioners uh, here at the OAS uh, should think long and hard about uh, this case, if the case is brought to them, because uh, there is, there could be uh, uh, adverse consequences to the image of the commission in Brazil. Uh, uh, and I, uh, on that, I, I would like to ask my little question here to my friends in Sao Paulo. Uh, depending on how this case goes, if, for instance, instead of being a uh, review of sentences, this becomes a retrial, uh, do you foresee uh, the possibility of uh, people manifest, people to manifest their insatisfaction in the streets about this? Is there such a possibility, such a component, where it's not? What do you in, in Sao Paulo well, say I, about that possibility? I'd just like to add about the, the possibility of an appeal to the OAS that uh, if this case didn't observe the due process of law, we should overrule all the criminal cases in Brazil because I have never seen so much possibilities <laughs> of defense as in this case. Uh, and uh, about the second, uh, I think I don't think so because, um, as, as was mentioned before, there is um, the possibility of changing is too narrow. There is not too many things that can be done and this kind of appeal does not appeal the Supreme Court to change the, the core of the decision. So lot, the, the majority or at least a large number of the defendants are really going to jail and there is not, this is not possible to change. For instance, I, I believe that the, the question that most uh, interests the, the media in Brazil is if José Dirceu is going to be in jail in the, in the closed uh, regime, in the in a real uh, prison, or he will be in, a, in an open place where he can work and etc. That's probably the, the most interesting question, the most important question for the media in this case. If he can move to the not be in a prison, I don't think it will be enough to mobilize people to go and protest. So the main, the, 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 the major changes that can happen, in my opinion, will be, won't be enough to, to make it change. Why yeah, from here? yeah but just uh, to add something. Yeah, it is important to, to mention that all these 12, they were convicted by several charges. And not all the charges are uh, on appeal now. Just those who where the, the convictions were not for uh, a extreme majority. So yes, even though if they were acquitted on conspiracy, they are already convicted by corruption. So there's no way of removing this charge of corruption. So there's no possibility of reviewing the, the whole case. Regarding uh, the inter-American system, is just one point. The, uh, the only possible claim is about the, the uh, right to a review, because this is an inter-American uh, convention, and since they are trial in a, a privileged forum, you don't have the possibility of. The Supreme Court has solved this before in many other cases and said that this is uh, 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 compatible with the due process clause in Brazil. So then you would have a conflict between an interpretation of this clause by the Brazilian Constitution and an interpretation of this clause by uh, the Inter-American Court. And the Supreme Court already said also that in Brazil, its uh, decision is uh, supreme than the decision of the, the court. Uh, so that is uh, what the, the, the precedent stands at this moment. Yeah, just one, I'd like to add, Chris, one, one information I'd like to add, I think we, we, they didn't mention. The majority of the judges that uh, uh, decided the Mensalon case, and who decided, were nominated to the court by presidents 
Lula and Dilma Rousseff. So uh, it's virtually impossible to make a case that this is a politi as some politicians have tried in Brazil, that this is a political trial. The people sitting there were nominated, starting with the president of the Supreme Court, uh, Joaquim Barbosa, was nominated by President Lula. Only, I think, of the sitting members now, there are only now two or three that are not. Marco Aurelio Melo, Celso, Celso. Melo, and uh, Gilmar. Gilmar Mendes. Yes, three. There are only three that were nominated by presidents for, before Lula. Uh, question here. Uh, yeah, I would like to know if you see... Okay, it's, uh, identify yourself. Just oh, sorry. Uh, my name, I'm Brazilian. I'm here at UC to a master degree in Georgetown University in um, democracy and government. And I would like to know if, because it's a political struggle, and um, Lula, yeah, he did a movement last year. He tried to influence uh, a justice of the Supreme Court. He went to an, uh, a lawyer, and to an office, and there was there was a sort of interference, but it, it didn't result. And uh, I think it's quite different when you nominate uh, justice before the judgment, and now he has uh, Dilma has nominated two of them, and I, I think that uh, will make the difference how they are going to judge uh, the next. The yeah. next church meeting, yeah, the Zimbabwe's intelligence, okay. and the, the, the appeal. And that's what I would like to know what you here in America think about it, because the justice, they are going to be nominated during the, ju the trial. The and, um, Should they excuse themselves? That's what Yeah, the, yeah. Okay. Because uh, Geostophilus didn't. And, and they will not. They will not. Because well, it, it is a political Let struggle. me just clarify what she is referring to. There was reported in the media, not denied. President Lula, uh, when the trial was about to start, went to uh, uh, former congressman, former minister of his government and of the Fernando Henrique Cardoso, minister of justice of the Fernando Henrique Cardoso government, former member of the Supreme Court, former president of the Supreme Court, Nelson Jobim, who has been in this building more than once, participating with us here in seminars. Uh, and Nelson Jobim and Lula met with Minister Gilmar Mendes. And that was the, uh, with what appeared to be an effort to try to delay the trial. And that's what I think was she was referring to. Now, uh, anyone here to could answer the question? I mean, would that happen in the United States? Be outrageous if it did. I can't imagine that the executive would in any way try and influence the deliberations of the court. I mean, it may have happened uh, historically. There may be some few incidences, uh, but uh, I, I really it's just something that, that totally would be unheard of here. Peter, the, uh, things here, obviously all decisions have a political element to it, but the only pretty obvious recent time a political decision that was political was that involving that Florida business in 2000 that led to the as some people would say here instead of the election of the selection of uh, George W. Bush to be president of the United States by one vote which was a decision, a split decision for Well, I, yeah, vote. but it's one thing for people philosophically to come to that decision it's another to be uh, an attempt to have it influence their decision to come that way. There's no indication that someone tried to contact the justices in good, uh, Bush versus Gore. They they philosophically came to the decision they came to. I happen to think it was political in the sense that it represented a, a, a point of view, but no undue influence in, was ever suggested in that. Okay, question from São Paulo, please. Well, uh, my name is Alexandre. I'm a, a master law uh, candidate here at uh, Fundação Getúlio Vargas. And uh, uh, we have a question here with my, my friend at Chevet. 
In Brazil, we have uh, uh, at the Supreme Court has the has a judge that has much more experience than others, uh, because such judge uh, uh, was uh, nominated uh, uh, kind of time that uh, now is uh, called here the decano. That is a uh, a judge that. Uh, uh, decided uh, a lot of special cases, sensitive cases in Brazil, uh, 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 when there is a kind of uh, 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 tight, tight, a tight of uh, a tight decision in Brazil. Uh, Celso de Mello is uh, now the, 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 the older judge, not in times of age, but in times of experience at the... Oldest serving, uh, I think I'd say the, sorry, the oldest serve, the oldest in the court. Yes, yes. There. And the name in English would be, he would be the dean of the court, I think, right? All right, that all right. Yeah. The canon, the canon. In Brazil, thank you. Uh, he decided uh, to accept the embargo uh, infringements here. Uh, our question is: Is there a kind of justice in the Supreme Court with with this uh, kind of experience, or with this kind of uh, um, mission in the Supreme Court in the United States? May, may I, before I pass the floor to you, uh, just to, you know, uh, interact with, with my, the, my, my, my colleague here. The word. Celso de Mello has not any special way of voting. Any, any, he's just the last member of the court to vote because he is the senior member of the court. And they, they vote in an order uh, which is from the youngest to the oldest. So. Uh, and the logic of this is to give freedom to the youngest member of the court, the junior member, to pro provide its own vote without the influence of the oldest. So uh, just to say that he doesn't vote twice or his vote is not in any way more important than others. In many cases where the majority uh, vote, like seven votes in favor of one thing, he will vote in the end and then he will lose. Uh, so, uh, just to, to, to tell that it was important because we, it was a tight vote at this moment. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, no, just, I want uh, Judge Massetti to respond to that. I am inclined, and I, I'm, I think the answer is no, there is no special anything. Although there are some judges that would love to have that, I can think of <laughs> <laughs> That really doesn't miss an opportunity, it's very funny. Uh, and, uh, uh, there's no no issue of seniority as far as who uh, uh, has more influence than another in terms of how they decide cases. The only parallel, I think, is during these closed arguments that the court has, the youngest the justice speaks first uh, for the same reason that the young justice, young uh, minister, would uh, would write an opinion first. Bear in mind, though, we don't we don't have cases where the, each judge has to write an independent uh, decision. Uh, ordinarily, we try and get a unanimous decision, or maybe you get a concurring decision, which is an agreement for different reasons, or a dissenting opinion, which is I disagree, but you don't get nine different opinions, uh, or 11 different opinions. I, correct me if I'm wrong. I think now what we have is doing the arguments. I think they now tape the arguments, and you can hear later, and NPR does that very well, where since sometimes they, they disagree vehemently. They do. And so there is a, a very interesting and pedagogical, I think, aspect of all of that. Right? There's, a, there's a funny story that some of the ju justices dominate the conversation. Justice Scalia is famous for talking a lot, but somebody told me once that, and I think actually this is a story from Chief Justice Rehnquist, uh, who repeated who, who this story at a small dinner that I was at a few years ago. Uh, there, what the American Medical Association had a case before the Supreme Court and they wanted to see what the justices were whispering back and forth to each other so they hired a lip reader to try and see what the justices were saying and one of the justices like Justice Scalia, Justice Frankfurter spoke a lot and they saw Justice Douglas talking to Justice Black and the lip reader came back and said what he said was I wish Felix would just shut up. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now, let me ask you, Judge Marcelo here, and uh, since you are a very young judge, and I hope that you are going to be one day a member of the Brazilian Supreme Court, uh, and you guys sitting behind, uh, and uh, Oscar, as, talk about this. Do you really need three hours to state your case and announce a decision? And um, Marcelo, when you become a member of the Supreme Court, can you promise me to be shorter, to be a little bit more concise? Do you guys think that it's part of the reform coming, that these people should be a little bit more to the point? Yeah, I promise you, Paulo, please, if you could indicate me in the future, I'll be very glad. Yeah, I and will. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I was talking to Oscar before this debate, and we were talking about that, and he and uh, Minister of Justice Barroso, before he had become a judge, a justice, they had already asked, proposed to the court that they should limit the time of voting for <laughs> each justice. And uh, well, in my opinion, that is also unjustifiable. We cannot understand how it happens. And there's something here that should be, should be emphasized is that um, in the U.S. courts, in the U.S. Supreme Court, we can see there is a lot of debates. So the justices hear the arguments and they talk about it and they make logic argumentation and counterpose the arguments and etc. And here in Brazil, it doesn't happen. For example, the, you, you've mentioned Mr. Celso de Mello, Minister Celso de Mello vote. His declaration of vote was too long, uh, like almost three hours, but there is no real debate. Uh, in another in another question, Justice Rosa Weber, for example, having been ke questioned by another judge, another justice, uh, instead of discussing the argument, had just said, "Okay, it's your opinion. I have mine." So if they have already their opinion, why should they get together and, and do it orally if they had already made their decision? So that's something that you cannot explain. They get together, they start with the case and each of them has two hours to read the vote and they don't change their mind during the, the debates so it's something that is more a formality than something that really works and I and I, I think that it's that, that can be uh, that is due to our in Brazil we are we have a, a very very formal uh, legal formation in perhaps that will change. But in the future, if I get to the Supreme Court, I'll, I promise I'll change that. Let, let me play I'll the devil one. lawyer for a second. Uh, one thing, in 95% of the Supreme Court cases, uh, what uh, the reporter says is followed by the others. So uh, it's, it's good when you say, uh, my, my, Matt, you said, I always have the same problem when they say, well, the court decided 60,000 cases last year, say, you are lying. Uh, no, no, e yes, we were telling the truth, but 95% of these cases were very swiftly decided by a, 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 a unanimous court with the reporter winning, because they are simple cases that are repetitive cases. So it is another problem of the, the, the process, of the, the, the structure of the Supreme Court, the repetition of cases, okay? But in the 5% that are the ones we debate, uh, the ones that we are talking about, stem cells, uh, uh, gun control, uh, affirmative action, there is where you have to debate. So I participate in some of these cases. Let's take affirmative action. Well, the case was decided in, in an afternoon. Uh, obvious there was a public audience before that, so I don't see it was a problem that some of the ministers took two or three hours to debate. I imagine how long it took to decide Brown versus Board of Education, probably months. Uh, so uh, because it's made in public, you see all the idiosyncrasies of the debate. You, you see in any other cases you don't see. As So I'm uh, even though I propose that Justice speaks only 20 minutes in each case. <laughs> I agree that some cases uh, are, are necessary that they, they speak more. And what the, qu the, the, the major question is that Supreme Court is doing too much. You know, the the uh, criminal cases should be taken out, other things should be taken out, and they could concentrate on constitutional law where, you know, a lot of time is needed to have a good decision. Thank you. 
to uh, adjust to the benefit of the students there, I wanted Judge Peter Massetti to describe a little bit the process of deliberation among the judges, the justices here, because I obviously have uh, uh, law, they have clerks that are brilliant uh, lawyers normally, uh, and uh, being a law clerk of a superior court, of a, of a federal judge is, or Supreme Court justice is a very important thing. Uh, and how, how does it happen, uh, Peter? Uh, is there, what is it? Do they, do, do clerks talk to one another at some point? I know that there is every week or every two weeks the justices meet, right? Could you describe that process, how they reach their decisions internally? Yeah. Uh, each justice has a number of law clerks. I think it's four uh, on the uh, Supreme Court. And basically, you've got to remember, they've got almost total discretionary review. There's really no obligatory review, and only some minor cases. So they can take as many cases as they want to. And they may get somewhere like six or 7,000 petitions a year, and they only decide 100 cases at the most. That's what they can do to control their DACA. Uh, when a case comes up from a lower court, and usually it's when, for example, when there's a, a split opinion between the different circuit, the circuit courts of appeal, and it's an important issue, that's the kind of case which the judges will, justices will decide to review. And at least four of the nine justices have to agree to take review of the case before they will. That's called the rule of four. Once the case uh, is taken for review, the parties then file briefs. There may be uh, 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 other, other interested groups called amicus curiae groups that add in. But they file their briefs, and then when these briefs come in, uh, what happens for the most part, I think now everybody is in the pool, but they have what's called a certiorari pool in the Supreme Court, where the justices will review the different cases that have come in. And uh, they will then be, they'll make a decision to accept review. When a case is accepted for review after it's briefed, it will be argued. And it's argued during a term. And in the same term that the case is argued, invariably it's decided in the same term, within one year. And so there's argument, it usually goes until about May, and then from May to June, and then throughout the term, but the key decisions are usually issued in May and June of the year. The justices will convene and the justice the lead justice who wrote the opinion will simply announce their decision. And, and there would have been oral argument on the briefs some months before, open to the public. The justices don't talk to one another, they talk to the lawyers uh, in terms of questioning. But then they write an opinion or opinions that, is, uh, that are filed by the end of June of the same time. Do they meet from time to time? Oh yeah, no, they meet, uh, they meet uh, we regularly. They meet to decide which cases will be accepted for review. They meet to decide how they're going to vote in the case. They meet to decide who is going to write the opinion, although that's usually up to the Chief Justice to decide. The Chief Justice, if he is in the majority, will designate the Justice to uh, write the opinion. If the Chief Justice is in the minority, he will designate our senior judge, our Celso Gemello, to designate who will write the opinion. And that's how it gets done. Okay. Uh, Paulo, no. uh, uh, from the Sao yes. Paulo side, we are running a little bit out of time. We have uh, some other, uh, so if we could uh, come to a close, which I'm yeah. very sorry about it, <laughs> because the yeah. conversation uh, is very nice. We actually know the government here is closed. We have, we have a time. judge who has no. uh, uh, cases. <laughs> I think for Judge, judge Massetti would like to say something about judicial reform. Uh, yeah, if, if I may, this is very brief. I want to end on an up note and do some perspective. Constitution of Brazil, 1988, 25 years ago, right? So we're not talking about a long window here. You had a dictatorship of many years before that. Since that time, you've had a constitutional amendment that introduces discretionary review in the high court, sumo de vinculante, binding precedent. You've got something called justicia volante, where you send uh, boats up the Amazon to take care of social security issues for Indians, or you send out fully outfitted buses to the interior to hear cases where a judge and a clerk are participating. You have uh, uh, small claims courts, which have be become a victim of their own success that they're so used. And you have a huge movement underway right now in alternative dispute resolution, including arbitration. A datum that I got just two weeks ago at a seminar was this. 17 years ago, Brazil did not recognize international arbitration agreements. 
Today, Brazil is the third most active country in the world seeking review, uh, seeking arbitration internationally. So when you talk about judicial reform, and I would disagree with the statistics in the Supremo, I think there's been a significant reduction uh, in the caseload there because of Summa de Vinculante binding precedent, because of repercussion general, which is, which is discretionary review. There has been movement, and Mensalão, in my opinion, is on track in the same direction. Is it perfect? No. Is there much to be done? Yes. Will it never be perfect? No. But there is a noticeable trajectory. Well, with that, I would like that to thank uh, uh, all friends present here, all friends present at, in Sao Paulo at the Fundação Getúlio Vargas. I think this is a wonderful collaboration. Uh, they, I hope this is, is the first of many uh, Fundação Getúlio Vargas uh, Law School. Uh, or Direito FGV, Direito GV, as we call it, uh, American University of Washington College of Law. Uh, special thanks to Oscar Villena, Dean of the Getulio Vargas Law School, Judge Peter Massetti, Senior United States District Judge for the District of Maryland, and an adjunct professor at uh, the school at the American University of Washington College of Law. Matthew Taylor, Assistant Professor of the School of International Service at American University, and uh, Federal uh, Judge Marcelo uh, Cavalli. Uh, I'm very grateful to you all. Uh, I am especially grateful to two people here, uh, the Assistant to the Brazil Institute Program, uh, uh, Michael Darden, uh, and our uh, brilliant uh, uh, intern, uh, Ana Carolina Cardenas, who is very proud to say to everybody that she is from Campinas. And uh, I am grateful to them. Uh, the glitch we had initially had nothing to do with the tremendous effort that Michael put to get us uh, connected and on time. Uh, but, you know, sometimes things that are out of control in the United States government is still out of Michael's control. So <laughs> we had that problem. Thank you very much. Uh, it was an honor to uh, host this. And let's make this the first of many. Thank you, guys. Okay. Well, well thank, you. thank you very much. I would appreciate all of you. It was a pleasure. Uh, and also would like to thank from our side, Otavio Dias, who, who put this together from the FGB uh, Point of view. And obviously, I wish it will be the first from several uh, uh, debates, uh, which were, would be very interesting for, for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.